All right. Uh, so kind of the, the title of my talk that I had in my head was Little Tech, Big Impact. So I'm not going to talk about anything revolutionary as far as technology is concerned. You saw I had a spreadsheet up in the background. Uh, so many of us have used spreadsheets to do things like manage servers lists. Now in DevOps, we actually do that in Evernote because that's the new way to do it and it's in the cloud. <laughs> uh, but what the, the title that um, Steve, I forgot your name for a second, put on it was putting, putting tech to work for your community, right? And I think it's a really important thing that as we've looked at some of the talks yesterday and uh, Tyler's talk of, you know, I got this great idea of how we can teach all our kids to program and sometimes, well, the kids just need shoes. But there are other areas in schools that we can actually help. So this is a story of my wife. Uh, this is not me or my wife. It's... <laughs> Uh, I also don't do crosswords. And the other thing that I noticed that was odd about this image is like, who actually like, takes a paper to bed with them anymore, right? It should actually be a couple with iPhones in their hands or Android devices and on those instead. So this is an artist, artist's rendering of what it would be like of me and my wife in bed. <laughs> um, and as I'm sure a lot of you are married, and as you know, when you're married and with kids, that time before you go to sleep is actually an extremely important time if you happen to be home and not traveling on the road because you can actually talk without getting constantly interrupted by something. So my wife's on her phone, and uh, she's at the time she was the treasurer of the PTA for the elementary school that my kids went to. And she rolls over to me and she says, can I talk to you about something? So right then, any married man or anyone who's been with somebody for a long time knows exactly <laughs> what's about to happen. And so now I'm in bed with Admiral Akbar, and she starts to tell me about how um, the school district has decided that they need to realign the elementary school boundaries. And this is because the elementary schools or some schools are over capacity. And also because the school board decided, and I gotta be careful because this is actually gonna be posted online later. Um, and I need to be nice, so hi, uh, President Pope, uh, the president of the school board. So they decided to close magnet schools and they decided to close the magnet schools in our district because uh, they were too expensive and we needed to save money. But that doesn't necessarily lower your expenses because you still have this set of kids that actually need to get educated somewhere. And so as the kids went back to their home schools, what ended up happening was you created an overflow situation. So they saw this one little solution of trying to save money because a levy didn't pass. Uh, as many school districts around the country are actually having problems with money and levies not passing and things like that. Uh, the Tea Party is actually, you know, pol politics aside, but the Tea Party is actually getting extremely involved at the local level and school boards and things like that and fighting a lot of the levies and things like that. Um, and that's good and bad and we won't discuss that one way or the other and how I lean on that. But what ends up happening is, is the school boards have to go and make tough decisions. And so they made the tough decision of closing the magnet schools. Well, the kids still need to get educated somewhere. And so it ended up causing a realignment process to get triggered uh, based upon the school board's policy. So there were about 80 kids that they needed to find room for. And thus, what this means is you take all of the kids in the entire district and you have to shuffle them around somewhere. So it's 80 kids and what actually ends up happening in some of the scenarios that we'll see, a thousand kids get impacted and shuffled around. So I don't know about you, but when I was in school, I actually went to four different elementary schools and as I kind of look at this process of realignment, it kind of touches very close to me because I know that there was a lot of trouble of me adjusting uh, when, when we switched around to all those different elementary schools. Now some facts about Westerville City Schools. So I live in Ohio. Westerville is a suburb of uh, Columbus and Columbus is right in the middle of the state. Uh, it's the one in the middle of the state. Cincinnati's down in the south and Cleveland's up north. Uh, it's the 11th, the 11th largest district in Ohio. 
uh, we get really good ratings, excellent with distinction constantly, I think five years in a row now. Uh, and it educates about 15,000 students. So between the three high schools, the four elementary, or I'm sorry, the four middle schools and the 14 elementary schools. Uh, and in the elementary schools, there are about 6,500 students uh, that go to these elementary schools. So my wife tells me about the process. She tells me what's going on. And thus, as part of this, um, you know, we, we decide to get involved. And the first step that we do to get involved, and I just to be honest with you, to kind of lay this out on the table, this is the first time I've ever gotten involved in anything remotely in my community or politics or anything like that. So I, uh, uh, while this may sound like a good idea, I give you a little bit of warning as well, right? Uh, it's, it'll be interesting, especially when you're fucking with kids uh, and, and parents get very mad when like some of the visceral comments that were made about the realignment and what people didn't want coming into their community and all this other stuff, it was really, really uh, disturbing that I live in this community. So I just warn you ahead of time before you get involved. Um, so my wife's like, we have a PTA meeting. We're gonna talk about this at the PTA meeting. Uh, I'd like for you to come because you, you, you're pretty good with people and you can talk to people and find out what's going on and you're good with numbers and whatnot. Uh, so I go and what ended up happening was um, the process was explained to us of what was going on and essentially what was formed was a realignment committee. So it's not the actual board but the board goes out and they find people uh, in the district to actually um, uh, decide how they're going to realign the schools. And the committee was school administrators, some principals, which I kind of had a problem with, and three community members as well. So uh, what you end up having is you have the community members that are kind of fighting maybe for their schools or for the community as a whole. You have principals who are fighting for their own individual school because they're trying to protect their interests. And then you have the administrators, which I'm not really sure what they were doing at some points in time. But what was happening is this realignment committee was generating data because, as you know, Thomas Jefferson said, an informed citizen. Citer citer I, I won't even attempt to say the word. Uh, so it's the only true repository of the public will, and the people cannot be safe without information. So, as a good realignment committee, they started publishing this information. And so, this is what they would put out about what they were going to be doing and all of the different options. So how many parents do you think actually would read something like that and would be actually interested in all of this data? Uh, they also put out maps. And so these are the things that people really liked, right? And these are the, this isn't something from 1996. This is the actual map that they, they published. Uh, but people really liked it because you got an idea of where your school was, and you got an idea of what school you would actually be going to. So the color code indicates what school you would actually be going to. So a couple interesting things that I'll point out about the Westerville School District. Uh, so first off, you notice there's an extremely heavy concentration of schools in the north. So that blue line that kind of curves around, that's 270, one of the outer belts. Um, and pretty much Westerville is actually all above that 270, but uh, it's a long historical thing called win-win. Westerville is actually responsible for much more than just Westerville's actual city limits as far as educating kids. We're uh, responsible for a large portion of kids that are actually in Columbus. And as part of that, they don't want to actually build schools down in Columbus. They would rather bus those kids up into Westerville to educate them in Westerville. They don't want to make the capital investment of building a school in Columbus and then Columbus changing their mind and then taking that school over or something like that, right? And then that school kind of being useless as far as educating Westerville kids. Uh, so you notice there's actually only two schools, maybe actually three schools down at the south end, and the other 11 schools are all north. Um, 
The other thing that you'll notice is that there's this big cluster of schools right in the middle, right? Kind of where that light blue and dark blue is and red. So what the community wanted was neighborhood schools, right? So I'm kind of setting up the constraints for you of what you have to work with in something like this so you understand. It's just not as simple as, all right, let's put the kids here, let's balance it out from a socioeconomic and racial perspective. It's uh, other factors as well. Because if you look at this problem, what you actually end up having is you have a problem that you could actually solve very easily with computers if you just put in the constraints and build a program to actually solve this. And this is essentially what we did, though we didn't automate the process at all. So that's kind of the, the logistics of what you have to work with. And then everybody wants to go to the school, of course, that is closest to them, right? Um, and then that creates, especially uh, in the middle, where the blue and the light blue meet, there are three schools within a, uh, about three quarters of a mile of each other that they all want to try and put elementary schools. And they need to be neighborhood schools. So how, and then there isn't a strong concentration of kids. Like there isn't, a, it looks like a big geographical area, but there isn't a lot of homes in some of those areas. Some of that is actually still farms. And thus you don't have enough kids to fill that. So you have to bus kids up or you have to fill that area from somewhere. So that's kind of the problem that we had to work with. So the PTA meeting, I already told you about that. So the first thing that I did was, uh, we did a PTA meeting. We found out there's a realignment committee the following Monday. We went to the realignment committee, me and some other parents that were concerned. And I started really kind of seeing what was going on. And it was really weird because you're not allowed to say anything. So imagine there's a, a table of like 12 people right up here and you're watching them and you're watching them work. And you can't comment on the insanity that they're doing or the fact that Becky isn't paying attention or anything like that. You just have to kind of sit there and watch what's going on. And so it was interesting because they were like a new member of the community. They greeted me. They were like very excited to have somebody new there. Um, and I started kind of watching the way they were working. And they're basically taking paper and shuffling it around. And we were like, well, what about this planning block or what about this? Uh, set of kids and where could we move them and things like that. And so very much what you would say stereo stereotypical government committee as far as the efficiency. Because then they would make these changes and they would go back to this company that they outsourced everything to and then get that company to regenerate those maps. They paid like $25,000 or something like that for this company to generate this data and this map with a, um, a geographic information system which, by the way, Westerville actually has an office that has its own geographical information system. So they could have actually just, if they were going to pay anyone, they could have paid Westerville to actually do it for them and kept the money in the community instead of paying it out. Although Alex might have an issue with that as far as being able to contribute into the ec economy of the entire whole part of Columbus. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, so. What was really interesting was like, they were extremely slow in what they were doing, and it took a lot of time. And this committee had been meeting for months already, and they still hadn't come to a conclusion. So this came, that was in the morning, that was on, on a Monday morning, and then Monday evening there was the board meeting. And so we got to go to the board meeting, and somehow I got volunteered to talk at the board meeting. Uh, so I actually shaved, believe it or not, and I put on, you know, broke out the Brooks Brothers and looked very cleaned up. Um, and I spoke at the board meeting. And as part of that, I presented, we, we, I kind of find it interesting because I went into the committee meeting and they're like, oh, hey, how are you? And everyone's great, you know, really nice. And they didn't realize that I was going to go and stab them in the back at the board meeting. <laughs> so at the board meeting, I presented about 400 signatures of these petitions that we got that the community members saying that we wanted this process to get halted. Because another interesting part is that we had a new superintendent starting in uh, July when the, the new school year started, or the new fiscal year started. And so we're going to go and we're going to realign all of the elementary schools, and then we're going to have a new superintendent come in, and he's got to live with this, and he has no say in the process. It seems kind of silly, right? Um, so we presented these petition uh, signatures. But another thing that was interesting is that there are rules to the realignment. 
And so props to Joe for uh, this. This was also in the uh, uh, Friday last year, uh, this image. So there were guidelines of how they actually needed to realign, and they really weren't following the guidelines. And so one of the guidelines is, is that the schools, when they realign and they're finished, the schools need to kind of match the socioeconomic um, ratio and the racial ratio of the district as a whole. And in some cases, they were actually filling schools almost to where uh, it was 60% free and reduced lunch and 60% um, minority as well. And the problem with that is so there's clear-cut studies that when um, kids do better when they're not all packed, all the bad kids are packed. And I don't mean, I, that sounds really bad, <laughs> but kids that of a lower socioeconomic at times have more problems in their schools. And when you pack them all in one place, there are much more problems that happen in that school as a whole. So there's clear cut studies on it. As far as my background is concerned, I went to uh, St. Louis public schools. And so I actually went to schools that were extremely bad. Um, and I lived in the good part of St. Louis. Um, I also, uh, my high school's claim to fame was that it was the first school in Missouri to actually get armed police officers to walk it. Uh, so I kind of know when schools are bad and when schools suck, how it actually affects students' performance. So that's Roosevelt High School, Joe, by the way. Yeah. Um, so we saw this problem and luckily I was in a job where I actually had a lot of time on my hands. Uh, <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, and so and like, I started looking at the problem and I started looking at the problem and I'm like, there's a better way to do this, right? So we've got all of this data, right? And all of this data is kind of publicly available. Unfortunately, this was in a PDF, um, which is the best way to publish data, right? Didn't you say it was publicly available? <laughs> it's publicly available though, right? I mean, um, and so luckily, it was actually pretty easy to copy and paste it and kind of do some cleanup on it. And so all of the other data you need is there as well. Um, and then there's mapping data. And so to kind of explain what this map is and also to kind of explain what's going on here. So there's what's called planning blocks of how they split this up. And so this is also kind of interesting because me and Donnie were talking a little bit yesterday of like, this is also kind of what's done when you're realigning con congressional districts and things like that as well. So they split up Westerville into what's called planning blocks and each one of those planning blocks has a certain amount of students in it. And they try to split up the planning blocks based upon neighborhoods, right? So you'll see, if you look at a map and a satellite view, you'll see like clearly cut divisions of neighborhoods as Westerville has grown and things like that. And in some places there's a creek, right? So that's an obvious geographical boundary that you can draw and say, all right, well the kids on the left side of the creek are never gonna go play with the kids on the right side of the creek because there's this natural boundary in between them and so the left side needs to be one planning block and the right side needs to be another planning block. The other thing they do is they split it up by like major roads as well because one of the guidelines is that when they realign, they need to prevent kids from crossing major roads of like speed limits of 45 or higher, right? And we have some of those in Westerville as well. So they split up the map into these planning blocks and then these planning blocks get assigned to a school. So this is the actual, the way things are split up now. Um, and you'll notice like down on the south, they've just got these groups of kids and they don't know what to do with them. So they just, they ship them to one of these uh, other schools because there isn't enough capacity um, down in that area to handle all of those kids. The other thing that is interesting is that um, the South is much more densely populated than the North, but all of the schools are in the North as well, right? So that's another kind of problem that you have to work with. Because down on the South side, it's more of apartment buildings and things like that. Uh, up on the North, it's much more single family homes with a lot of land in between the single family homes and so forth. And in some cases, they're still farms. So how do you clean up data when it's in a PDF? Uh, you use some form of uh, Unix utilities. Um, and then the spreadsheet. 
so I ended up creating this spreadsheet. And while this is little tech, right? Uh, I don't think it's anything great, but it's a very easy way for you to start to experiment very quickly. And so um, allowed for rapid experimentation. It allowed for anyone to build the scenarios as long as you had a little bit of knowledge of Excel. Uh, you could look at the data from different perspectives. So the way that the school district was putting it out was maps only and then these tables. And that may not necessarily be the right way to look at it. Maybe you could look at it different ways. So one thing that I did was um, kind of drew the line of where the free and reduced lunch percentage was across the district and then looked at how much of a skew that we had from each school for each scenario. So you could see, am I, you want those bars to try and be as close as possible to the average across the entire district and so you can see how far you're skewing with each one of the scenarios. Um, and I repeated myself, so it allows anyone to create scenarios. Uh, <laughs> and then the maps. So the maps were a lot tougher because, one, I didn't have access to a GIS system. Um, and luckily, though, the school district was actually very helpful in making sure that this company, Cropper, that they were working with, they sent me over the files to where I could actually recreate the maps. Luckily, they were also in KML. They weren't in PDF. Uh, KML is a markup language that's used by something like Google Earth. So I could actually go in and I could build these maps um, that kind of help us draw the way it actually looks because this is what people used and this is what people liked. Now, it doesn't look as nice as the other maps, uh, maybe because it's a little more modern. And there's some limitations as well because um, Google Earth doesn't really allow you to get rid of this satellite view, and people kind of like the plain background as well. So there's some improvement that could be done, and I'll talk about that towards the end. Um, so scenario building. So I built this spreadsheet. We had an email thread going of parents, and uh, at one point in the thread, I think we got up to like 400 messages. Uh, it, was, it was insane the amount of email traffic that I was getting. It was more traffic on this than it was from work. And this pretty much consumed my time uh, instead of work for quite a while. Uh, so I sent this spreadsheet out to this list, and what was really awesome was this other mom picked up on it. And um, I told her, I, you know, in my, I gave pretty clear instructions of what you needed to do. Go to this, and actually, let's just look at the spreadsheet real quick. Um, so essentially all you needed to do was go to the data and this is all of the data and you could just go here and actually change uh, what school you wanted this district or this planning block to go to. So if I go to two, that'll actually move it. It'll tell me how many kids am I actually moving around by doing that. And then I could actually go over here and refresh this pivot table and it's going to instantly give me the results of what the distribution of kids in, are in each school, right? So it's very simple, very easy to use. Um, she took it and she started building all of these different scenarios. And this was actually before I had the maps, uh, the mapping files so that I could actually build them. So this is what she did. And this is actual picture I had her send me yesterday. So she printed the maps out in black and white and was drawing her own maps by hand, right? Uh, which um, I wanted to make sure that she understood that I wasn't criticizing her because I think this is a lot of ingenuity to actually do it. But it also shows like how um, passionate she was about it, right? And how passionate everyone was about it. And the problem was is that there were a lot of people that were extremely passionate about it, but there weren't many people that were actually doing anything about it, right? Uh, so very typical, and we see in our tech community sometimes as well, right? How easily are we uh, going to criticize somebody, but then we actually don't actually go and solve the problem, right? Um, so she was extremely passionate, and of course, in fitting with the theme of the conference, we ended up doing scenario building over beer. So we first started at the coffee shop, which Anil and James will appreciate, uh, and then they closed on us, and then we actually had to go to the bar, had to go to the bar, uh, and finish building these scenarios. No, 
at that point, we had gotten the KML files and we started uh, building them out in Google Earth. Um, and so what's really interesting is when we got our first success. Um, so we built a few scenarios and uh, we sent them over to the realignment committee. And our first success was that the realignment committee took one of our scenarios almost verbatim and used it. And so they saw that as a way of throwing us a bone, but we saw it as a way of they were actually hearing us. Because I don't know if you've actually ever been to a school board meeting or a committee meeting or anything like that, but essentially, um, when I t spoke to the school board, you got five, I got five minutes, so it's almost like a lightning talk. Uh, you don't have any slides or crutches or anything like that, and you just have to you know, like give this passionate speech to these people that are just kind of staring at you, and you think that they're not really paying attention to you or caring what you're saying at all. And um, you know, a lot of people got up and spoke about how much they hated the realignment committee or the realignment process, and the next thing that the school board would say was, great, we're moving along with the, with the process, right? And it's like, did you hear us at all? So our first success was somebody actually listening to us in the school district, and we thought that was great, right? We have a voice now, we have a way to communicate, and the other key thing is that we were communicating in a way that they were, um, that, that, that was familiar to them, right? So we were presenting their data back to them in the exact same format that they were giving it to us. And that was actually really significant, I think, for our success. Um, the, ses the second success came when, after another committee meeting, I saw them shuffling around paper. We had already sent, I think we actually sent the spreadsheet over to them, and they're still, like, working it out on paper. And some people on the committee have no idea of the data, they don't know what's going on, um, which was kind of another telling thing that I'll get into a little bit more. But what ended up happening after that, I walked up to one, somebody and I'm like, I'd be happy to help. I'd be happy to sit on the committee. Yeah, I won't give my opinion uh, because that was very, uh, they didn't welcome opinions while the actual committee meetings were going on. And I'll just sit there and I'll run these scenarios for you as you come up with them. You tell me what planning block you want to move, we'll move it and we'll see the data instantly, right? And so that was actually really cool because then they're like, yeah, let's try and make this process better. So they're listening to us once again. The problem kind of came when I got called to the principal's office. <laughs> so uh, one of the former, or one of the administrators on, and who actually ran the committee um, was a former principal. And um, I come in to the committee meeting one day, I'm all ready to help and everything, and I, this was actually the second meeting that I was gonna set on to actually help them run these numbers. And he's like, Mike, can I talk to you for a second? And he calls me into this office, I think it was his office, and he's like, um, I heard you've been criticizing us on social media. Yeah. Like, you, you did. Uh, and this was the controversial tweet. <laughs> and you can see that uh, the only one person that favored it, it was actually my sister. <laughs> and then we can also see Anil giving comment in the background as well. <laughs> what? It's all his fault, right. Um, and then it ends with, I think the... The progression ended up to where there was a drunk tweet at the end. <laughs> and I say, in the land of the blind, the deaf man is king or some bullshit. Because that's really what it was, right? It was, it was a bunch of blind people and the one-eyed man came in there and like, hey, I can see a little bit and you guys are walking into fire or something like that. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is what I got called into. And what's interesting is like, uh, I, okay, it was inappropriate, I probably shouldn't have said it, it was a bit of a dick thing to do. Um, he pointed out that plenty of people know Excel in the office, but it was really helpful to have a member of the community in, uh, and then that way, you know, it shows that they're reaching out to the community, which is actually something that the school district is trying to do more of, because we've had levy fights and people have been really pissed off at the school board and just everybody's, it, it's not a happy time in Westerville schools and it still isn't and it hasn't been for about three years. Um, 
And it was great that a member of community, but you know, I've downloaded Google Earth and I know how to use it. It was his response to me. And I could just think at the back of my head, it was like, well, then why didn't you, right? Why are we shuffling paper around? And also, I thought of this on my run this morning, uh, this quote that I like from Thomas Carlyle. So for the superior morality of which we hear so much, we too would desire to be thankful. At the same time, it were but blindness to deny that this superior morality is properly rather an inferior criminality, produced not by greater love of virtue, but by greater perfection of police and of that far subtler and stronger police called public opinion. So it's really about perspective. It doesn't matter what the reality is. So kind of going back to some of what Tyler talked about yesterday, the, the reality is one thing, the way people perceive what you're doing is different. So while we were told by the school board to assume positive intent constantly, we were sitting there watching the school board committee fumble over their work, taking forever to get this process done. We either wanted it to be canceled or done because the school district actually wanted it done as quickly as possible as well. They were rushing down this path, but they didn't have the tools they needed to actually make intelligent decisions. They were kind of doing everything manually. And that's why what we ended up really doing, if you think about it, is we had the Lean School Board Committee, right? We were doing experimentation, so based upon Lean Analytics, a shout out to O'Reilly, uh, who donated some books, media sponsor. Uh, but if you read this book, and I've only read part of it, but it's really about taking data and doing rapid experiments over that data, and that data could be anything, right? And so really we were able to set on that school board committee and we were able to rapidly iterate over scenarios and reject them very quickly or find ones that were possible scenarios that would work. And as we did this, what was really telling, as we went through the spreadsheet and people would make suggestions, people on that committee would make some of the stupidest suggestions because they hadn't actually had a way to actually look at the data, right? So they're like, well, let's move such and such uh, planning block. And they want to move it to one, this school. And it's like, well, there's 110 kids in that planning block. And there's only 90 seats left in the school. What are you doing? Why would you move that? And then they would want to move this other planning block. And it's like, well, it's very dense and free and reduced lunch. And if we move it, it's going to change the skew of everything. They hadn't really studied the data and because they didn't really have good tools to study the data. And really what we ended up doing was giving them a better way to study the data and make rapid decisions. So the final win came in um, this announcement. So I was actually out of town and my wife went to the school board meeting and she texted me and she's like, they're halting the, the realignment decision and they're gonna wait and do it later and they'll just deal with the kids overflowing. And um, so from our perspective, this was actually the final way that they actually started listening to us, right? So they heard the community, and this was actually going to be a very interesting meeting. Um, it was extremely packed. There were kids. Uh, some schools basically mobilized in force and brought all these kids out. And the kids were actually going to were signed up to talk to the school board. Um, and at the beginning of the meeting, they kind of broke protocol and they said, we're not going to talk about the realignment, it's off the table and we're not going to do it, right? And from a community member's perspective, it's like finally they listened to us, right? But the problem is, is it's just delayed, right? We're still going to have to go through this at some point in time. Um, and so some ideas that I've thought of for next time. So you got to understand, like, when, from the time me getting involved to um, um, like the first couple committee meetings and where we're needing to make suggestions, it's like weeks. And all of us have full-time jobs as well. And uh, not a lot of time to like research other things and better ways to do things. And so we needed to get something out there very quickly and the spreadsheet and the maps were the one thing that we could do very quickly to get results right away. But there's definitely better ways to do it. So next time, you know, create a site or an app for the phone or whatever, or your smartphone, to allow anyone to create scenarios. And it would actually be kind of a trivial thing to actually program uh, pretty quickly. Uh, you could solve for the optimal scenario. So we know what the constraints are. Neighborhood schools, good distribution of free and reduced lunch, good distribution of uh, uh, racial uh, distribution as well. 
And using those, you could actually solve this problem out automatically. I actually made the suggestion to the uh, committee, uh, one of the committee members. So Westerville has a computer science department from a university. We have a small university, liberal arts college, in our town, like right dab smack in the middle of town. And they have a computer science department. So how awesome would it be to actually recruit this computer science department to say, go and solve this for us, right? Go and create all of these things to actually go and solve this problem mathematically, because at the end of the day, it's just a mathematics problem. Um, leverage open source or real GIS systems. So I don't know if anybody's ever played with GIS systems, but they're really freaking awesome. Uh, basically, you have a map and you have data behind that map. And most of this data now is being freely published. So I could actually go to Franklin County and Delaware County where Westerville uh, is. Uh, we, we, we go across those two different counties. And I could actually download all of the parcel information, so every lot. And then you could take that data with the school board data of what kids actually live in those houses or the number of kids. And that's what the GIS company actually did for $25,000. But then you can just draw those planning blocks and when they drew those planning blocks, the data was instantly there of how many kids were actually in it just by drawing on a map. So it's really cool what you can do with GIS systems if you know what you're actually doing. And at, at, when I initially got into this, I had no idea of how powerful GIS systems were. Uh, and then lastly, how can this be applied to other problems? So the, me and Donnie were talking yesterday and he's like, you know, you could solve for the optimal solution for uh, redrawing your congressional boundaries, right? Both state and federal on the state and federal level. Uh, of course, that would then mean that you, you would actually have a fair distribution of Republicans and Democrats in a district and you might actually get somebody else than the person who's been that lifelong politician. So that might be more uh, contentious. Uh, so that's all I have. Any questions? Yes. So I'm assuming that you just had too many constraints to try to even attempt this within Excel. So I attempted it within Excel, but there was something wrong that it didn't actually run right when I first did the couple of couple scenarios. And like I said, we were on a really tight time schedule. And so there were three parents, uh, Bree and Derek, and then myself, who were actually kind of working on this. And we just didn't have enough time to actually try and build out the scenarios. But I had attempted at one point. Because there is a what if, right, in Excel, to, yeah, the solver. Yeah, and there's so many different possible combinations of how you could actually solve this. But when you, when you, when you get into like planning blocks need to border each other because you're trying to build neighborhood schools, you actually reduce that problem set down greatly because the neighborhood schools one actually eliminates a lot of possible scenarios because you can't have you know, a school in the north and a school in the south or a district in the, or a block in the south and a block in the north going to a school in the middle, because then they want to be neighborhood schools anymore. Also, that was what was interesting was that um, the really rich people wrote a petition, and they were taken off the table uh, as far as being able to move. And this, uh, by Governor Kasich, the governor of Ohio, actually lives in our district, and I don't know if he lives in that particular area or not. In the back, all the way in the back. Um, I, I've actually struggled with this where I live in congressional districting. Yep. There's politics writ large and maybe less petty but it's still scary. And I think when you talk about optimal scenarios, you know, we talk about goals and constraints. Yep. Right? And you can there are algorithms to define optimal scenarios within the goals and constraints. What I've discovered is that no one's willing to talk about what their real goals are. Right? I mean you talk about the constraints, you talk about some of the goals about balancing the number of, of subsidized lunches and things like that. Mm -hmm. But there's at least some percentage of people, their goal is to shut all the kids with subsidized lunches into one school, right? I mean, if yeah. you're in Texas or Virginia, where I live, the, the districts, North Carolina, the districts, like I grew up in Austin, Austin is now about seven districts, one of which stretches to Houston, another one stretches to Brownville, 180 miles away, right? Wow. It's a mile wide for most of its distance. Just along the highway. Yeah. So what was the goal? Well, the goal was to wrap up some liberals 
here and some liberals down here right. and put them in one safe district so that no one else could ever win it, yep. but they would never be a threat to any of the other districts. And no politician ever wants to write down that goal. Yeah, and so I guess in this process, it was more of what the community goals were. Now there were, like there was a principal on the committee who was protecting her school very much. When, and I thought it was totally inappropriate that somebody who has like real stakes in this, as far as what their school is going to have, is on that committee and influencing decisions. Like she would veto things and the committee chairs would say, okay, then that's off the table. And that's totally and completely unfair. So that kind of gerrymandering was taking place. But the other thing was like, it was really interesting. You get to see who people really are. And like I said in the, in the beginning, I was really saddened uh, to like some of the neighbors that were like, if this happens, I'm moving. And it's like, but then like, what are you doing? Like, come on, come together and like, like make the community stronger. There was a PTA president who got up at a board meeting and said, we don't want any more free and reduced lunch kids. And I'm like, what is that? I mean, what kind of, like, I just can't understand the mindset, right? I don't have that perspective, I guess, right? Did you ever get asked, No, I didn't ask. And I think because towards the end, I was kind of on thin ice because of my social media <laughs> mishap. <laughs> um, but what was really interesting was I talked to a school board member and she's like, that's exactly what we did last time. We had somebody there with a computer who actually had a real GIS system and we would make a suggestion and they would instantly be able to tell what was going on. So why they didn't do it this time, I have no idea. And what was kind of ironic about that is one of the chairs of the committee was a big fan of dimming. Uh, so if anyone knows who dimming is, you know, he's very much into process improvement and continuous improvement and the Toyota way and all of that. Uh, so it was kind of ironic that we were shuffling paper around and not doing much of an improvement. So.